Welcome to the Surge 2012 Pink Shirt Thursday Lightning Talks. Um, pink Shirt Thursday is a thing I've done in the last two companies. How many people are wearing pink today? One. Is that pink? No, it's more of a peach. That is terrible. Go out and get pink shirts and wear them on Thursdays. You get the whole company to do it. It's really cool. Um, my name is Gary Magnuson. I'm emceeing. Um, or trying to. Um, we've got a really great slate of talks tonight. Um, some of them are, they, they range from the serious to the funny. Um, so there should be something for everybody. And um, we're going to start with one um, from a person you all know, Theo. Um, a talk that he guarantees will fundamentally change your life. So, Theo. All right, thank you. Someone knows how to use a computer. <laughs> what? Nope. <laughs> Swipe. All right. There's some. S this is going to be challenging. Space. No space. You're gonna have to click. This is not good. All right. Good. All right. So, um, I talk a lot about scalability, uh, but uh, and I, s I say that it's important. But I actually want everyone to listen very carefully, and and try to receive as much as I tell you because in the next five minutes you will learn something that will radically improve the quality of your life for the rest of your lives. Um, I'm gonna talk about shoes and shoelaces, and I'm gonna change your life. Uh, I'm a dad, and in this picture, I was 29 years old, and I did not know how to tie my shoe correctly. Loop, swoop, through the hoop, bullshit. I did the wrong thing, right? So I'm here to share that knowledge. Everybody understands how to tie their shoe. How many people here tie their shoes? Here's the trick question. How many people here tie their shoes incorrectly? Probably. Now there's, there's doubt now. So loop. Swoop through the hoop. Okay, this is called a slipped reef knot, and it is sadness. <laughs> Children everywhere on the playground are tugging on their teacher's shirt, saying, "My shoes untied. Can you help me tie it?" Right, and they're si going down and tying shoes, and then they go tie their own shoes, and they get untied too. Like this doesn't make sense at all. There was a TED Talk on tying your shoes, a global audience where someone could come in and change all of your lives, and they teach you the wrong knot. Fucking crazy, right? So we are going to fix this once and for all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Trivia question is, what are they watching? <laughs> Given the aghast looks, it actually involves two ponies and one cup. Um, <laughs> so. I have a friend named Carl Hutzler who uh, used to work at AOL, and uh, he wrote a blog about his friend, Theoretical Ken, who referenced another site, which was a how-to, and that's how I learned how to tie my shoes. Um, loop, swoop, through the hoop. But wait, there's more. You do not stop there. You loop over again. through the hoop, and pull. This is it. This will actually change the quality of your life. I have two runners in the audience. Is uh, Dave, Dave's here? Yes, uh, and, and Brian? 
Yep, okay. If anyone, I, I, well, I'm going to ask you to all untie your shoes right now and tie them the correct way. If anyone has trouble, we have two people in the audience that are willing to come help you tie your shoes the right way. It's important. This is a life lesson. You should do it now. It's worth it. If you don't get it right today, you're going to miss your opportunity. All right? This is important. This is called a double-slipped reef knot. Yes. You need help. We, need, we have a help, help request down here. Need that slide. Yes. The previous slide. This is absolutely critical. Right? It will never get stuck. Right? It will never come untied accidentally. And you will never be picking at the double knot that you tied ever again. It's right here, Dave. That's it. All right, thanks, Theo. Um, I was remiss in not thanking our sponsor. Um, Yong? No, I can't gong him. Um, next up, we have Dan Kubrich from AppNeta, who is our sponsor um, for the Lightning Talks this year. Um, you've seen the problems we're having with the size. I apologize. You all set? Uh, I feel much safer walking up here on stage with my new shoelaces, so thanks. Uh, what menu am I looking under? Slideshow. Oh, Command-Shift-F. That's what you said. Okay, cool. Uh, go. By the way, uh, AppNeta, we sponsor the Lightning Talks. We do application and network performance. Uh, we can talk about it more later, but if you want to win an iPad, Find Eric. He's wearing a gray shirt with a cool logo on it, and uh, he can he can get you in on that. So, distributed tracing is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, what is it? Everybody seems to be arrow keys. You guys really think this is something sophisticated? Click right. Is there a secret? Oh, it is a one-slide talk, isn't it? Um, geez. All right, this isn't going to work. All right, we'll do it like this, because uh, here the keyboard works. OK, so uh, Twitter Zipkin you might have heard of, especially if you read Hacker News. It was based on Google Dapper, Google's internal distributed tracing tool, which was based on an academic project called Xtrace. I started a company called Tracelytics, um, and there's people that do it in-house. Uh, what, what's everybody looking for with distributed tracing? Well, basically, web applications are distributed systems. Even your basic LAMP stack has at least you know three or four different processes that are working with each other. And you want to figure out uh, what's slow, how your application is running. So you could say, uh, well, I'm just going to go in and put some debugging log statements, or even better, now I'm going to use StatsD and start dumping some stuff, and I'll know which parts of my application are performing what way. But there's a little bit more than that that you might want to get. Uh, let's say you see an exception in some back-end service, and you're kind of wondering, well, is that from this other request in this process? Uh, it would be really convenient right now if I had a single-threaded, non-evented, one-process monolithic application, because I could just look at the logs. But uh, instead, what you really want is to kind of be able to say, oh, there was you know this that happened, and then this other thing that happened. and uh, you know, now I understand the full path of, of what's going on. So that's what people are trying to solve with distributed tracing. Basically, they just want to know what's going on with their computers. So uh, how do people try to solve that problem? Well, there's kind of uh, two possible approaches here that I can think of immediately. One of them is uh, really, really simple. It's kind of stupid sounding. Let's attach a unique identifier, uh, propagate it throughout, kind of like radio tagging or tagging sharks. Um, you guys saw that. And uh, so the tricky thing is here, we're going to have to figure out how to get that unique identifier from process to process and so on. 
Uh, maybe that doesn't sound so great. Let's try something else. Um, so we could watch the connections between the different things. And here we can be a little bit more agnostic. We'll just treat it as a black box, watch the things going over the wire. The problem is with threaded and evented things, you try to model what's going on inside them, and that gets really hard. And pretty soon, you actually wish you went with the unique identifier, like uh, all the guys on that first slide. So here's a little screenshot from the Google Dapper paper. Uh, this is what they think a distributed system looks like. And they're pretty much right. Uh, here's another picture of it. So you get a request going to your web application. It does a couple things. You're timing it. And uh, so what we really want to get is the structure and the timing. So let's figure out first, you know, start, start simple. Let's figure out how to get that uh, identifier across all the different protocols here. So uh, HTTP is pretty easy. So any extensible protocol, we can add an X header. It's going to be backwards compatible. If you send it across the wire, other guy doesn't know about it. They just ignore it. Uh, some protocols aren't intentionally uh, kind of extensible, but you can do it anyway, like Thrift. If you happen to have an internal RPC protocol like Finagle or Google's RPC, you're the boss, you can do whatever you want. Uh, some things are a little bit harder, so SQL, you could put in a comment on the way there and then maybe try to pull it out of the log file and get it back, but uh, you know, it's a little bit trickier to do, and what are you going to do with the ID when it's in your SQL server? Are you going to patch it? You're probably not Percona. Uh, memcache, kind of similar problems, and there's two protocols there. So some of the stuff you're actually going to want to observe from the client side. You can get a lot of information just from looking at the query being run and the timing there. Uh, so the, the green stuff is kind of what you're what you're looking at at this point. So we've got the uh, we've got the timing that's pretty obvious. We'll just uh, look at the beginning and end of events in each process. For the structure, you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna figure that out as we move through the system? So we could either encode it in the ID as we go along, so kind of build up this chain of breadcrumbs. And uh, you know, we can see that's going to get kind of long. But the nice thing about this is at every point, you know where you've been. So that's pretty cool. But uh, in a big distributed system, that can become a pain. So actually, again, what all the people on that slide shows is kind of treating it as a graph and just remembering who your parent is and so on. Um, I'm about to get lightninged, uh, so we're not going to talk about reporting. Uh, instead, let's take a look at. Uh, What's going on? We've got this graph of events. If they're all blocking calls, something that's pretty cool here is uh, you can just kind of figure out the timing for each one by subtracting the uh, blocking events from each other. If it is a asynchronous call, it's a little bit harder to figure that out. You have kind of some, some traversal problems there, and you might visualize it like this or like this. Uh, here, last thing I'm going to show you, uh, pretty cool. So let's say you have a massively distributed thing. There's a lot of stuff going on in parallel here. Zoom out a little bit. This is uh, Triton sort. Uh, it was like the fastest sort in 2011. All right, zoom out more. Other things we're not going to talk about. <laughs> Thanks for going easy on the timing. Yes, if my buttons worked. That's what she said. Um, up next, Sammy Barra. Is that, am I pronouncing that right? Um, engineering team lead at AppNexus with Concurrency Kit, Scalin, Ain't Easy. Doug, reference. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Select all the pages for it. All right. So just to give you some background on Concurrency Kit, many years ago I was brought into the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center to help them with some scalability issues they're having on a large scale shared memory multiprocessor machine. So I started focusing on scalable synchronization algorithms in that context, and I found there was no real research platform uh, containing at least production quality implementations of lightweight synchronization primitives and scalable synchronization primitives out there at the time. 
So I started developing a very simple library. At the time, I was initially beginning with Spinlock, so I began with a very simple library of Spinlocks. And later, that evolved to include more complex primitives as I started implementing scalable, non-blocking data structures. So it's, it's evolved to meet a lot of the demands I've met at companies that I've worked at and demands from the outside community. So just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that's in there, uh, the idea of concurrency kit is to provide uh, pr to provide uh, basic primitives to build scalable non-blocking systems in C, uh, and it's targeting freestanding environments, so it's very portable, and it's supposed to be an end-to-end -end solution, so it provides safe memory reclamation, which is one of the biggest barriers for adopting all this technology. Uh, some of the recent stuff that's went in there is, uh, includes a lock-free hash table, single producer, multi-consumer, uh, multi so single writer, many readers. Uh, it's pretty low latency, statistically weight free, though it is formally lock free. Uh, it also includes a lock free hash set, multi-producer, uh, single producer, multi-consumer, trivially, trivially transformable to multi-producer, multi-consumer case. And it even includes documentation uh, most recently. So. Bottom line is, uh, if you're interested in adopting this technology, a lot of people are locked out from it because you have the, the big iron giants uh, essentially hoarding a lot of this technology, not sharing it with the open source community, or at least uh, the usage is in very specialized environments such as kernels, et cetera. Please contribute. It's released under a revised BSV license. I've been told that the code is clean. It's a young project. There are a fair number of contributors. Uh, we use it in production at Nexus. I know uh, at least two hedge funds also use it in production. Uh, so if you know C, please join, refer your friends. And if you feel like the stuff is over your heads, uh, I'm more than happy to assist. And you have a lot of uh, knowledgeable people on, on the mailing list that would be happy to, to help you out. So check it out, concurrencykit.org. Equipment change. Let me start turning things on for you guys. Boring. Yeah, that's boring. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. All right. Great. So up next, we have somebody many of you also may know, um, Brian Clapper, who is the yeah the CTO. You of um, Zirconis, and um, he's going to take it this in a little different direction, um, if we can figure this out. Oh, this is the new, uh, hang on. No? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't shout, get a Mac, right? I mean... I guess I have to start this one. Okay, how many of you have made beer before? Good, so if, if I miss a step, because I actually haven't made it in a little while, you can yell at me later. So this is about making beer. Beer is essentially four ingredients. You got water, you got malt, you got hops, you got yeast. That's, that's it. If you're German, that's, that's really it. If you're American and craft beer, you can add a few other things to it, but it's basically it. So some beer making is real fancy, you know, equipment. We got some kettles and boil and mash tuns up there and some other ones that'll flip over and whatnot and control this fancy bullshit. No, this is my house. <laughs> I got a kettle, I got a cooler, and I got a messy garage. That's all you need. So in the back, the cooler's the mash tun. That's, I'll get into that in a minute. And then I boil everything in the little kettle there, and then I dump it out and make beer. And I don't make it in the bathtub, so it's not like bathtub gin or anything like that, but yeah. So the first step of making beer, you have to get the sugar out of the malt. It's called the mash. So you add hot water to the mash, get it to about 150 degrees for an hour. That lets the enzymes convert all the starch to sugar. And you basically end up with sugar water then. Uh, the sparging is, is after the mash. That's rinsing all of the sugar out of the, the 
you know, what you have left there into the boil kettle that you're going to boil later. And you get to about 165 degrees. So this is also to show you how easy it is. If you've never done it, you should go do it. It's fun and easy, and there's like math involved whenever you have like this many grains and this much water, this much heat, and it's great. And then you boil it, and this is what kind of what the boiling looks like. It has this funky shit in it as it boils. It's usually the hops all combined with the top, and you boil it for an hour. It smells freaking awesome. <laughs> so yeah, that that great. You just stick your head over it the whole time, and it's 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 great. So you let you do that for an hour or like 90 minutes, depending on what the, the recipe calls for. That's it. You just sit there and watch it boil, and you add hops every now and again. It's great. And then you cool it down. You've got to cool it down as fast as you can, because at this point, bacteria love the stuff, and bacteria is the one thing that will spoil beer. It doesn't matter. You can screw up a lot of steps. You can not put enough grains. You can not put enough hops in. It's not going to ruin the beer, but bacteria will ruin the beer. And it sucks, and it smells bad, and, and whatever. So you cool it down as fast as possible. This is where I have a garden hose hooked up to a, a copper coil. I'm not making moonshine here. Um, you get it down to about 70 degrees as quick as possible, 80 degrees maybe, because then you're going to throw the yeast in. Uh, yeast, if, if you get it much higher than 80, yeast will die right away when it hits it, and then you're not going to have anything, and then the bacteria will get to it as it's, you think it's fermenting, and the bubbles you see in the fermenter are actually bacteria. Yeah. So you put it into something like this, this plastic bucket. You, you put a plastic bucket full of this stuff in your basement for a couple weeks, and then you hope that it tastes good afterwards. So ale's about, it's going to ferment about 68 degrees, so if you have a basement, ale is, is your friend, that's what you want to use. Lager actually takes a lot more work than this. Uh, it has to get down to about 45 degrees, so you really need a freezer with a temperature controller on it to actually heat up the freezer or cool it down, depending. And then you need it to sit for a month to lager, and it's, it's actually more difficult and you need a lot more equipment. I don't actually make that. I just make ale. The two different types, ale ferments from the top, lager ferments from the bottom. That's basically the difference. And then after a week or two, you'll have this. Um, this is in a tank to clear it out, basically. It still has a bunch of shit in it, and you, you have to siphon it off from one to the other. So you'll put it into something like this, and it'll settle all of the, the crap down to the bottom. And you let it in there for, some people, I usually leave it in there for two weeks. I find that's good. Um, some people put it in there for a month or more. And it's up to you. Uh, and then after that, you have beer. And I had a visual aid I was going to try to have, but apparently there's no beer till six, so fuck it. That's it. I'm out. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, next up, we've got Scott Sanders from Ride Charge. And um, his is titled Disaster Porn. <laughs> Anybody? Do you remember Disaster Porn? Well, this is five minutes of it. So, not quite as much fun. But maybe. At least it's titled the same. I'm on the clock. All right. So uh, disaster porn and uh, why it's important to be a journalist. So my name is Scott Sanders. I work at Ride Charge. We do pretty cool things with taxis. Uh, we'll skip that. Anyhow, uh, we make a mobile app that lets you book, track, and pay. And we also make a hardware device that sits in the back seat of the cab. It's got a touch screen, credit card, swipe. It's also got a cell modem in it. Cell modem's pretty cool. Uh, we get GPS events over UDP, and we do your transactional stuff over HTTPS. So. June 5th, problems occurred. Los Angeles, cab driver's telling us that the swipe fails. Um, hardware team pulls a couple back. We get some logs. They're telling us that there's an SSL handshake failure. So uh, Phillip's over there. We're the tech ops team. First thing we do is we remap Apache to the same version of libcrypto and libssl. About that time, problem vanishes. So awesome. Let's go get a beer. Now fast forward to June 12th. Uh, shit hits the fan. We're getting the same problem, widespread. They pull it back. The log errors say the same thing, but we've already fixed that, so what could it be? Um, furthermore, we're still getting GPS events. We can see all the cabs on a map, and we're not seeing traffic drop. So first thing you do is you call your ISP, and the first thing they do is tell you to fuck off because everything's working great on their end. <laughs> now, <laughs> you pull the standard toolkit out, <laughs> and you start looking, and uh, Everything looks good, but Nmap's giving you some weirdness, uh, some inconsistencies. So to understand them, you got to look at TCP IP. Uh, if you hit a, a new connection, everyone knows the handshake. What happens if you hit a closed port? Well, like Arter said, we should get a reset, which is, uh, again, fuck off. But um, I'm only gonna re getting a reset every now and then. About half the time, I'm getting a timeout. So to me, this smells like a routing problem. But we have to prove it before we can do anything. So I'm getting a GPS update. It's got a UDP packet. It's got a 
GPS coordinate and IP, and I've got a timestamp on it, so I've got just about everything I know. And I know what should happen if I hit a closed port, so let's do some magic. Uh, this is a little bash script I wrote. What it's going to do is connect to one of our log servers. It's going to pull events off off the log, then it's going to fork a little in-map connection in the background to sort of prove or disprove my theory. Here's some results. Sure enough, we're getting some timeouts here on a couple of these. But uh, the only way to get non-technical people to agree with you is to visualize things. So this is DC. This is a couple minutes of tab updates. Everything looks good. Yellow's good, by the way. Red is bad. This is LA. We've got red everywhere. And it's not like a tower's down. There's nothing geographic about this. I mean, it's everywhere. So now we have to beat up our ISP. Uh, you can't actually hit them, but <laughs> eh, you can. So after about a dozen calls and probably 24, 30 different escalations, we end up with a team of guys that are pretty good. And we sit on the call with about 20 people at this point for about six hours. And finally, one guy real quietly goes, hey, hang on. Things get real quiet. Boom, everything works. Awesome, <laughs> magic. So what the hell happened? Turns out on June 5th, these guys migrated to a new data center, and it was a complete failure. So they rolled back just about the exact point in time that we pushed our SSL fix. <laughs> now, <laughs> back to June 12th, what happens is they migrated again. This time it was successful, or so we thought. But um, cell traffic gets pooled onto different banks of routers when you're at that scale. And one of these routers happened to have a bad route in it that was causing asymmetric routing coming out of it. And there was a stateful firewall right in front of that. So as you can imagine, UDP works, but TCP is screwed. So when they updated this, everything fixed. And it was wonderful. Which brings me to being a generalist. Um, everyone knows DevOps a little bit, but the culture sort of requires a generalist on your team, as many as you can get. Um, you need to understand the full stack, and this is going to let you troubleshoot problems. You need to be able to communicate with everyone across your teams, your sysadmins, developers, hardware engineers, network engineers. Fewer people in the war room is going to let you solve problems faster. And the net gain here is you're going to save time, you're going to save money, and your team's going to be more valuable to business as a whole. So as your career advances and you specialize a little bit, never forget to be a generalist. So thank you. Thanks. Um, we've had one uh, speaker withdraw. He, he's sick. Um, so, um, well, Fred, you're up next. Um, what I, you can get ready. If anybody would like to do a lightning talk, you don't need slides, um, and you want to try it, please volunteer. Um, or I think we're going to have to draft Archer to do one. All right. <laughs> All right, so next up is uh, Fred Moyer from Red Hot Penguin Consulting with How NetFilter Saved My Bacon. Now, is this in any um, connection to the bacon shortage that we had? Uh, no, I think that was caused by uh, breakfast this morning. <laughs> the, the bacon shortage? Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm going to probably forward it first. I don't think we have it now. Okay. So this is about how NetFilter saved my bacon. Um, Free Wi-Fi, you guys have seen it. Uh, I developed some software that put an ad bar at the top of every uh, web page on the network. You know, it pays the bills. Uh, this is the ad bar that we developed here. Um, you may have seen some other uh, uh, ones that built by other companies out there. You know, this one's on obviously on Southwest. You'll notice how the page didn't fully load. Um, that's because this one sucks. <laughs> how does it work, um, the one, you know, competitors? Well, they've got tiny proxy running on the network gateway. It inserts some JavaScript into the HTTP response that splits the page into two frames, one for the ad bar and one for the web page content. But uh, you know, it's on this embedded device, so proxying HTTP responses through there is really slow. Users get angry, and this solution just sucks. Um, I didn't know how they were doing it when I started, so ignorance is bliss. Uh, the way I approached this was I had IP tables roles on the gateway. Um, NAT forward HTTP request to a co-located mod Perl web proxy. And I would insert the ad on that proxy and return the response. It was a lot better performance than tiny proxy, but as you can imagine, run all your web traffic through your co-location, that doesn't really scale and it gets expensive fast. So I had to find a, out a way to make it scale. Um, and I did that by having the proxy uh, rewrite the image request to append uh, port 8135 to each of those requests. 
and then this was a complete hack. Um, I wrote an IP tables rule to change that port from 8135 back to port 80 on the gateway router. And it worked. It worked really well. Um, you know, 95% of my traffic was no longer going through the proxy. It was fetched directly from the destination. This is kind of, you know, what I call hillbilly architecture driven by desperation and just hacking away at it rather than planning for something like this. But the uh, performance was a lot better than tiny proxy. Um, you know, you could barely even notice uh, latencies. But there was a problem. Uh, it didn't completely work. Uh, when you pass a request like this to Apache, um, it handles the uh, extra host port just fine, but Lighty throws a 400. So now 20% of my static content requests were returning 400s, and that made the users and the network operators angry. So I had to figure out a way around that. Linux has, uh, if you've ever seen the insides of uh, the NetFilter um, code, it uses an SK buff struct in kernel space. And I was thinking, you know, maybe there's some way I can actually, on the router, take out that uh, colon, you know, take out the 8135 from the host name. And it took three months of net filter coding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, these are a couple snippets from, uh, from the modules. I've got a link to them later on in the talk. Um, just, you know, it was, it was frustrating. Lots of work with TCP dump and VMware fusion, um, loading kernels, you know, passing traffic through, watching it fault, restarting the VMware uh, virtual machine. Um, but some of the uh, some of the API hooks in NetFilter are really awesome, really elegant. You can search through um, packets for text, um, and you can use uh, this function nf nat mangle tcp packet to actually change the data in the packet. Very cool stuff, uh, hard to work with. Um, here's a little architectural overview of how it works. Uh, you know, the request goes out to foo.com. Uh, I've got this IP tables rule in here that redirects it to my proxy. The proxy goes out, gets the response, sends it back. Browser parses a page uh, and sends the request to uh, foo.com 8135 bar JPEG. Um, and then the net filter module looks at it, uh, changes, changes the actual content of the packet, removes 8135. Uh, request come back, comes back fine. And it works. And it's fast. Um, you know, the average latency was, you know, less than 500 milliseconds for most requests. Um, you know, just completely demolished tiny proxy. It was, you know, much more usable. But uh, unfortunately, the product didn't survive. You know, as you can imagine, users don't like the ad bar up there. And, you know, the dynamics of ad getting ad revenue from that are uh, a non-starter. So, you know, if you're stuck in an architectural dead end, uh, maybe you can get in there and use NetFilter. Uh, the code is up on GitHub. I uh, uploaded it today and open sourced it. Um, there's a couple of links here for uh, SK Buff, and if you want to look at the other guys, go see Tiny Proxy. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Uh, up next, we've got Chris Burrows. Um, he's an infrastructure developer at Add This, and his talk is titled, What Can Go Wrong When Preparing a Lightning Talk? <laughs> so hi guys, I'm Chris, uh, like I said, an uh, engineer at Add This. Uh, we make a social sharing button. It's a little button you can put on your page and help people share uh, Facebook, Twitter, or whatnot, whatever is popular. Um, it's on about 14 uh, million domains, and it's viewed about 3 billion times a day, so that's about 3 billion HTTP requests that come into our data center, um, in addition to various other services we provide. Um, so yesterday, I was going to work on this lightning talk about um, cool stuff you can do with the telemetry data from the new navigation timing API that came out not too long ago. Uh, but instead, something else went wrong. Uh, so we have uh, this externally facing service uh, th that uh, gets about half a billion requests a day, um, and um, it's back. It ought to be in um, two different locations, but due to some like extensive network, network maintenance, we had it in only one location for a while, um, you know, temporarily, but longer than it should have been. Um, so, uh, and it's back in one of those uh, fancy NoSQL database things. That which one doesn't really matter for this talk? But in this case, we can lose uh, one host and everything's fine. Two hosts and uh, reads are okay, but writes are bad. And three hosts and uh, bad errors everywhere. Um, and so, about uh, 5:30 yesterday, uh, the, a fan in one of the chassis uh, dies. Uh, so we lose two nodes in this um, this cluster. Uh, so the page gets escalated to me around 5:30 a.m. 
uh, I start looking at it and realize there's also another box uh, that has a problem, has a disk failure. It's the uh, the setup so there's the OS and all the data are on separate like partitions and raid stripes, and it's the OS one that's failed. Uh, so it's kind of sort of still working because like you can SSH in one interface and not the other, but like if you run pop, everything explodes. Um, and the sort of server database has a bunch of sta uh, states it has for nodes. They can be up, down, leaving, joining, whatever. Uh, in this case, it realized um, this node was question marked, literally, um, as its state, which I thought was really insightful and helpful of it. Um, I'm still unclear as to whether it was working or not because it should have failed, but I don't know, maybe question mark nodes are counted in. Um, so anyway, so we got a data set attack in there to um, uh, replace the fans. He grabs it from an unused uh, uh, chassis and switches it to this one we're using right now. But it turns out the inventory uh, was an error and that was actually a used chassis. So we just lost like another cluster doing something else. Um, uh, okay, so we get the fans on. We can now uh, boot the boxes remotely. One of them comes up uh, great. The other one uh, comes up but without disks. Uh, so we're like, oh, that's, that's, that's weird. And we're you know, talking to the, the ops guy. So we do with this more. We're like, oh, yeah, there's like a BIOS bug where like sometimes the disks like disappear. And it's not like a file system or RAID like disappear. It's like the BIOS doesn't know there's disks plugged in anymore. Uh, but if you power cycle the box, sometimes they come up. So we tried that a dozen times uh, and still had no disks. So that was sad. So we had one box up. Good. We restarted that. Um, uh, and we're trying to look at um, how can we uh, migrate data. Um, there's, a, there's a procedure in this fancy database to like, okay, this node is gone forever. I don't care about it. Provision this, use this new piece of hardware and copy data from the replicas and make it the primary. I mean, you know, it's all good. Uh, but through various uh, bits of deferred maintenance and technical debt, we were using a wicked old version of the database where this magical move everything over here command doesn't work. Um, or more likely it has a very low uh, probability of success. So like maybe like one in like 10 times it'll work, but the rest of the times uh, you say we move the node and it goes away and then it comes right back. Because um, like they're gossiping with among each other and they don't all like forget about it at the same time. Uh, so this required PSH and a for loop just trying on every single node all the time to remove this node, uh, which eventually sort of worked. And we, so we brought the, uh, the new node up uh, now we're only one node down, so we think we're doing great. Uh, but by now it's kind of uh, peak load, and uh, things aren't really doing so well performance-wise. We're throwing lots of 500 errors. The service really isn't available, even though there's enough hardware to support it in theory. Uh, and we look around and realize uh, we're swapping all over the place, and uh, that's bad. And we're like, oh, why was swap on on these servers? We're like, oh, we don't know. Okay, we turn swap off, and it's like swap off. Uh, I can't allocate memory. Failed. And we're like, oh, well, I guess our database is all messed up and swap somehow. So uh, I guess we'll have to kill, you know, kill that. So, you know, you know. PSH, sudo, kill nine Java everywhere, just you know, kill everything on the box and restart. It's like, oh, swap off fails, can't allocate memory. And look at it, and like, you know, do top, load average is like zero now. It's like still something somewhere. It's using memory, and that's really sad. Uh, but then around this time, our uh, uh, primary firewall uh, has excessive load and falls over, so we lose all connectivity to that data center. Um, so, so now I have nothing useful to do. So I'm thinking, like, oh, what's going on? While well, we, you know, uh, you know, do you know, DNS load balancing, shift traffic somewhere else. So we get the data center back, log in realize there's a monitoring data ring that was somehow using up lots of swap, has a memory leak, whatever, something stupid. So kill that, and then we can bring everything back up. Uh, so we think we're doing great. We have all the hardware we need. Um, but then uh, something else happened. Oh, yeah, so oops, we made a terrible mistake because we killed, uh, we uh, evicted all of our caches in the middle of the day during peak load. Uh, so now uh, we can't handle traffic. Um, and like, the web service in front of this, uh, they, uh, they do crest poorly, and they fall over to you. Right? So it's just uh, 500 errors everywhere, can't serve traffic. Um, so we're trying to like nurse it back to health, or like slowly we'll allow more traffic in, or hope like the cat so the caches build up, or we're like try just catting the database files at DevNel to hope like you know do the OS cache, um, and then uh, a power switch goes out, uh, which is fine. No, no, it's good. It's redundant. Uh, but on the failover, we tripped the circuit, and so that then the the rack failed. Um, uh, so we lost a switch and lots of and we lost uh, about, like dozens of boxes and various other important backend analytics clusters. Um, but somehow miraculously, like those boxes lost power and the switch lost power, but these boxes somehow didn't lose power. We just like couldn't talk to them because the switch was down for until like we talked to the, uh, the vendor. We're like, well, why do we have no power? Why is the, why does this not work? So we get it back, and then we're like, okay, that's cool. Um, and uh, what happens next? Okay, yeah. So then that, that disk with the messed up. Uh, we don't really since we realized we, our buggy uh, software can't uh, like reprovision nodes. We uh, do the surgery where we just you know, flip, flip in a new uh, OS disk for this box, reboot it. Okay, we have all 16 nodes left, everything's great. Uh, but we still have this like load problem. So we're like reconfiguring the load balance to slowly allow more data in, uh, which succeeds uh, approximately 12 hours after the first cage went off. Um, and success, service restored, uh, but no uh, API time and lightning talk. Thank you. I was going to ask, what company do you work for again?
Uh, up next, we've got Dave Zwieback, head of infrastructure at Newton, um, with a appropriately, given what you just heard, talk called The Single Root Cause of All Outages. Hey, I'm uh, Dave Zwieback. I'm uh, the head of infrastructure at Newton. And uh, just so you guys know, we built an uh, adaptive learning platform. And uh, we have uh, a couple of hundred thousand students on it right now. And it's really helping them you know, uh, in terms of their educational outcome. But um, I'm not really here to talk about um, Newton. I'm here to talk about the single root cause of all outages. And I will use logic to prove to you that this thing actually exists. So um, by virtue of you know, all of our work, you know, we've all um, sort of experienced multiple shits hitting multiple fans, <laughs> sometimes at the same time. And um, you know, we've often wondered, like, hey, wh wh what's going on? Like, what's really behind all of this? And uh, wait, um, I thought this was a, a map. Anyway, so why does this happen? You guys, I mean, like, you guys basically do failure for a living, right? Like, this is your <laughs> job. So, <laughs> so I, I, I want to hear, like, okay, so why do you think, you know, systems fail? Come on. Stupidity. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's good. Nobody knows how computers work. Entropy? Okay, so I think we're getting closer. It's a witch. So th 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 there is a thing that sort of unifies all these things, and that thing is change, right? Somebody changed something. Somebody moved something, right? And so, like, change is happening not only in, in, in complex systems, right? I mean, we have, we have the, we're in the midst of some kind of a global climate change in the mo at the moment, right? So uh, it's, it's everywhere, not just in, in um, in computer systems. Now, the reason that change is happening, change is actually a symptom. It's a result of something. And the result it, it is a result of the fact that things are changeable. If things, if you can't change something, it's not gonna change. Logic. <laughs> right? So what does that mean, things are changeable? So this is like kind of bad news, but also not very, it's actually not news at all. The, uh, the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, 2,500 years ago, said all compounding phenomena are impermanent. Impermanent means not, it, it means changeable. And compounded means it has two or more things stuck together. I think we have systems that are kind of two or more things stuck together. So um, the, the thing is this, though. Um, the very thing that allows systems to fail is also the thing that allows systems to function. Computers are about state change, right? Can you see state change diagram? So um, if, if your system can't change state, there's no computing. So that's kind of the good news and the bad news, all stuck together. Now, the thing that we can't accept as engineers is that change is random. So um, in, in, in Buddhist philosophy, there's, there's sort of a classic uh, uh, example of, of, of this. And they say, okay, you have a seed which has the uh, ability to change into a plant, okay? It's a changeable into a plant. But it doesn't happen randomly. You need soil, you need water, you need air, you need, uh, you know, fertilizer and uh, things like that, a grow light maybe. And uh, most important, you need your, the, 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 the negative sort of conditions to not show up, like for instance, the DEA agent, and <laughs> then, <laughs> you, then you don't have the medical plant, right? Um, and so, what the hell am I talking about, right? Wh why, why is all this philosophy and, and agriculture important here? So, what happens when things fail is we do these postmortems, right? Where and uh, you know we call them five whys and retrospectives, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so what usually happens is like, hey, what happened? Oh, the server failed. And uh, 
why that happened, th the power went out. And why that happened, well, Bob pulled the plug. And so um, that's sort of what the a lot of postmortems look like. And so we remediate the root cause of the problem, being Bob. So we remediate Bob out of the job. <laughs> um, however, if you do know that the root cause of all outages is basically impermanence, like I'll, I'll save you a lot of time for your postmortems. Like you walk in, you say, hey, it's impermanence. Let's all go home. <laughs> Not quite. Um, so what can we do? Well, we figure out what are the conditions that allowed, the, the, that allowed this outage to take place. And so that's actually um, what the, the fundamental part of engineering is. Like it's a, the job description of any engineer is you methodically find and remediate conditions of failure. And so no surge talk without disaster porn. So <laughs> here's a little nugget from um, um, the root cause of this particular outage, which was eight nodes of graphite dying, um, is uh, impermanence. The conditions that allowed this to happen is that um, didn't check the unit of time and the um, Instead of reporting every one minute, uh, our whole cluster reported metrics to graphite every one second. Took down an eight node cluster. Good stuff. Anyway, um, these folks helped me uh, clarify my thoughts. And uh, please come to um, Alejandro's talk tomorrow on uh, Leptoid, the auto scanning library we wrote at Newton. Uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thanks. All right, so as, um, up next is going to be Mark Fowler um, with a slide. You do have a slide, that's right. Um, avoiding the risky rewrite. Um, but while we're waiting for that, anybody volunteering? Oh, good. Uh, okay, you can. You, yes. You'll follow Mark, and then we're going to end it with the final speaker, um, Brian Cantor. So, yeah, about about ooh, six years ago, I wrote a uh, article for O'Reilly about how to give the perfect lightning talk, and it involved preparation and checking your laptop works beforehand, and uh, and not wasting your time with minutes and uh, distraction, and continuing on when everything goes wrong. So here goes. Um, hi, uh, I'm Mark Fowler. I work for Siconus now, but. Previously, I worked for a company called Photobox. Uh, Photobox is um, Europe's largest uh, online photo service. And they're a growing company every year. Yep, that's the one. Ooh, with slides, that's good because I need a diagram. <laughs> uh, Photobox. So every year, Photobox has this annoying seasonal business model here where Christmas comes and they have to deliver lots of presents to everybody. But right here we have this big peak in demand and every year they have to retool and re-engineer because they're a growing company, so each year, each Christmas is bigger. Um, so let's see how, they, let's go back 10 years to Photobox starting out, 10, ten years, oh look, a single server, and you know, they scale the usual way, you know, split out the database server, add more web servers, go to a MySQL replication chain, split out the API servers, and now we start hearing problems, as you all know. Um, well, this bit here, scalable. Oh, I'll just buy more, stick more in our data center. This bit, mm, not so scalable. Uh, write load will, the write load to the master will eventually kill the replication slaves if the lag to the replication slaves doesn't become terrible. Bad things happen to additional websites when lag gets too high, but that's not to talk about that. So it's time to save Christmas again. Uh, quickly, please. Um, so uh, what should we do? Uh, well, the traditional thing is to shard. Hmm, yes, sharding is tricky. Uh, so it's a traditional system not designed to cope with sharding. There's a, the database uh, and the API server talk chatter back and forth a lot, and there's l if you put latency in there, everything gets slow. Uh, and it's not compartmentalized. Uh, photo books can have photos shared from other users in them, so you can't separate users out from one in each other. And these aren't insurmountable problems, but they're going to take time to develop, and Christmas is coming. Uh, so let's not rewrite our app right now, uh, especially since it's ooh, September. Um, so 
what did they do? They went to a different solution. They changed their database. They went to Clusterix, which is one of these fancy new SQL things. Uh, but the key thing about Clusterix is it speaks MySQL protocols. So as far as the app is concerned, it's speaking to the old MySQL database. Uh, no app rewrite, yay. And adding more nodes, well, not infinitely scalable. It's pretty damn scalable. You can just keep plugging them in and rebalancing aside. They just work. So hooray, Christmas is saved. Christmas comes again next year. Um, so now we have a system that is completely scalable within the data center. Yay. So we just keep buying more of these things, right? You just keep spending money and money and money and money for this peak here, this tiny, tiny peak for a few hours, for a few days a year. Mm, okay. So traditionally, this is where you go to the cloud. Well, hey, we get more resources. Uh, so we rewrite. Uh, rewriting again. I don't like the idea of rewriting. It, Christmas is coming, and I got this has to work on December the 20th. Um, and it's, it's going to be expensive, and the marketing department really want their features developed instead. Um, so what did they do? They didn't rewrite. They looked for another solution. They um, s discovered that they could fit all of their application parts on a single server. And they could run many of these servers in the cloud. So along with their traditional data uh, center, the DEA are coming. <laughs> 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 along, <laughs> along with the traditional data center, they spawn up many, many of these nodes in the cloud for just a few hours, which is relatively cheap because it's just for a few hours. And when a simple user comes along, a nice simple user, they redirect them away from the data center into the cloud, and then there's a completely unpopulated version of their stack running on this machine, and it slurps in the entire user data from the... Uh, 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 clean the main data center at a, in a f matter of seconds, and then the user just lives on the cloud, acting as if they're on the real uh, real site. And every time they write to the database, we keep a log of that. And then they d uh, then later, in about four hours, when everything cools down again, they can replay that log back to the main site, and the user can be then migrated back to the uh, main data center. Now, obviously, this doesn't work for all users. So Shared users can't do this because if they've got shared data, the data won't be there when they get into the cloud. And if they've got a lot of photos, they're not going to wait 20 minutes for all their data to download. Um, but it's OK because they can go in the main data center because the main data center now is much cooler because the majority of the traffic is out there. But this, and I'll be the first to say it, this isn't a scalable solution. But you know what this will do? This will save Christmas. <laughs> so I just guess I'm, my point of my talk is, don't rewrite if you have to, especially if Christmas is coming. Does the volunteer still wish to talk? Great. It's like a fashion show, isn't it? It's fucking bright up here. All right. So I want to talk about Twitter, um, specifically PR and marketing on Twitter. Uh, this is probably one of my very favorite sites. I don't run it. It's run by a guy who goes by the name Dog Boner. Um, <laughs> And it's basically just people post horrible things on corporate websites, and they get very sincere replies. Um, Pizza Hut is probably one of my favorites. Uh, Pizza Hut's Twitter, if you like schadenfreude, you will really like Pizza Hut's Twitter. Because it is just, it is page after page of this, of somebody who got a whole, well, this guy's obviously making it up. It's just apology after apology. Because <laughs> apparently the way this works is you order a pizza from Pizza Hut, because you're probably dumb or high, and it comes, it arrives all fucked up, so this happens. <laughs> so I think there's a better way to do this. I think Surge deserves better. I really do. So this is my Twitter. It's mostly worthless. Uh, it's a bunch of really shitty retweets um, about football. So yesterday morning, I posted this. <laughs> Uh, 
and I immediately got yelled at and told to stop because I didn't realize this at the time. Uh, these show up on the surge site. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I toned it down a little bit. Still dumb, but less. Uh, <laughs> and then this one, this is just, I love this. I really, I adore this one. Um, <laughs> no joke, that image is why I'm up here. <laughs> Everybody needed to see that. <laughs> one more time. So uh, you guys may have seen this, but I've been I've been posting shit on Twitter all fucking day. Um, this one, for some reason, people liked this. Um, I've never gotten retweeted more than twice ever. <laughs> I don't even know some of those people. Most of them don't like me. <laughs> I enjoyed this one as well. See, this is where I realized I wasn't gonna get in trouble. That's Robert Treat who's like three levels above me in the OmniTI food chain, not only didn't fire my ass, but retweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one I thought was, okay, whatever. Uh, and then after this, they turn into reactions to talks. Um, <laughs> I, I like the one about the chuds. <laughs> uh, this one I liked because that guy favorited it. Um, <laughs> and then this one, he replied. <laughs> Fucking social media, man. <laughs> I, I, I put this up because I want Archer to see it. <laughs> All right, real quick. Then there's this. Because <laughs> what better for a lightning talk than lightning tweets? And then finally this one, which went up about a minute ago. Thank you and good night. <laughs> All right, finally we've got... Uh, <laughs> Brian Clapper. <laughs> you don't spell it right? I don't spell it right. Somebody doesn't spell it right. I do. You want that instead of this? I do actually under I, I know I'm a software guy, but I actually that much hardware I do understand. I'm so sorry. Um, so uh, it, you know we have got a lot of kind of odd warts that came along for the ride, uh, and one of the ones I discovered recently is this thing called BFS. Um, BFS. Oh yeah, breadth first search. No, 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 not breadth first search. Oh, then it must be the boring file system or something, the better file system. No, 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 it's not that. What is it? What is it? Is the BFS? Oh, of course, is the big file scanner. It's like, what? This is in my user bin and has been here for 25 fucking years. The, so the, uh, what is the BFS command? I'm glad you asked. The BFS command is almost like Ed. Oh, okay. Um, 
it's, it's like, so I get the full power of it. Well, not so fast, except that it is read only. Um, OK, but it processes much larger files, in particular. Files can be up to 1024 k bytes and 32 k lines with up to 512 characters, including new line per line. And then someone had to add, well, only 255 for 16 bit machines. OK, something you should know. OK, so this is the, what we're running in, in SunOS here. SunOS, SunOS has never run on a 16 bit machine ever. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, we are definitely back in the friggin' dark ages here. And also, it's like, yeah, I mean, 32,000 lines, you aren't actually, I mean, are you kidding me? So if I do this, if I do, let's, let's do a little, uh, little awk here, a little awk love. Got to get the awk going on, man. So we do a uh, for i equals i equals zero. Uh, yeah, I bet you didn't think you were to see this. 33,000, i plus plus, print f, woot. OK, da 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 exit zero. Go to really big file. <laughs> OK, um, are you? Oh, come on! Come on, come on. Easy now, easy now. OK, we got a brace. We got a brace, folks. That, that was a par one. That was par one. Still at par, still at par. OK, uh, so now we've got a really, 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 really big file. And what is BFS going to do with this thing? I, I, I wonder what it's going to do. Really, a really big file. Too many lines. <laughs> I mean, really? Really? But actually, BFS is actually not the subject of this talk, because I got to thinking about BFS. And I wonder how much other shit came along for the ride. I mean, I just have never asked this question. I'm really embarrassed. To, like, I've never actually gone down into the hold with a powerful enough flashlight and said, who the fuck is down here anyway? <laughs> um, so let's do an LS of, of user bin, question mark, question mark. We'll pipe that through to more. And, and we see uh, a lot of old friends here, uh, and friends that we, we use every day. Some, some old, some new, are, of course, uh, the archiver. Um, at, you can write a great, I, I've got a great Y2K at story, by the way. Uh, at required us to destroy uh, $450,000 of the CDs to fix a bug for Y2K. Great story, but I'm not going to tell it now. Um, uh, BC, da 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 In a lot of these things we use today, I mean, there's good old Ed. Ed, I, I love you, but only if you were read only and could process files that were smaller than a megabyte. Um, you know, LD, obviously, LN, I mean, again, things we use every day. And you get some stuff like NL. How many of you have used NL? Kind of actually, well, oh, OK. Actually, I thought one or two hands would go up. I had never used NL. I had never seen NL before doing this experiment a couple days ago. NL has a man page. It's actually a line numbering filter. I mean, it's kind of useful, I guess. So I can, like, NL Etsy password. Like, OK. And there's all sorts of options for it. It's like, oh, one of these things that, like, just has kind of existed. And, it, it, and that actually seems kind of useful. So all right, that's fine. And then you go to PS, of course, you know, in PG, oh, and I'll see those man pages. And then I saw, so what the fuck is this? TA. <laughs> TA, like what is TA? And I'm not even gonna ask for a show of hands because if you raise your hand, you're lying right now. Um, so all right, no problem, man TA, got it. Um, okay. okay, okay, so uh, let's see. Um, wait, what do we do here? Well, we could, um, I guess we could run TA minus question mark. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> shit, 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 okay, fine, fine, fine. Uh, TA minus H, no, ah, TA minus help. Okay, no, fuck. Um, oh, God, I love you, Unix. Um, OK, so um, let's do uh, it. Obviously, it looks like it's blocked on standard in, maybe? We can trust it. OK, OK, yes, it's blocked on standard in. Fine. OK, so let's cat Etsy password and pipe that through TA. Um, oh, we actually have something. OK, we have unknown input character 162R. It's like, OK, something from the past. Um, <laughs> all right, so w w w let's do, all right, let's strings this motherfucker. Um, <laughs> And, and oh my god, I, I'm getting things like, you can't. It's not a file. <laughs> and oh, can I? Oh, can't I, TA? So OK, TA dev null, that's not a file. Let's, I mean, let's just confirm that dev null is not a file. Dev null is not a file. OK, character special, not a file. Nothing up my sleeve. And actually, I'll, we'll do this at the top of the screen. Not a file, TA dev null. That should tell me, give me this, fuck you, TA! Like you can't even do any. All right, so all right, let's go back to strings again. That was kind of interesting. All right, so but there's a lot of weird shit here. Like print this page again. Uh, go back n pages. Is this like some like like Roth choose your own adventure or something? Like some in, like interactive fiction? Um, I've got like user lib font. Um, do, I mean, what? Then then you get this HP twenty six twenty one. It's like okay, uh, nest oh, nest it too deep. It's like oh that's good. All right, well, you can't, it's not a file. Like, that is a, that's, that's a weird thing. Like, we don't, 
we don't say that a lot. Like Unix commands don't just say you can't, it's not a file. That's just a very, it, and first of all, they it also, because it's so confrontational, um, like you can't, it's like fuck you, I can't, it's actually Unix, I'll do it myself, I'll rewrite you if I have to, get out of my way. So like we just don't, we, we don't say that in Unix, we don't say you can't do things, you can't do anything. So all right, so that's a weird message, and I gotta believe, that again, we got the source for this thing, so go look at the source if I can find it. So let me just go to user source command, no problem. Oh, I, so we go to command, and so now I'm, I'm in the source tree here, and of course it's a TA directory. Okay, all right, no TA directory, fine. Um, so fortunately I run cscope, um, God's own tool here, and we will actually, let's go look for the egret pattern of, not that. Um, <laughs> God, oh, oh God, that could have been so much worse. It's like, oh thank God. Oh boy, that could have been so much worse. That's just like a random sketch of like Kate's presentation not loading for me, and that could have been so much worse. Okay, that's good. Um, so uh, you can't, it's not a file, and does this, oh my God, we have, okay, we are now in, we are in TROF, TROF.D. T, it's like, this is, I am in TROF, I knew it was TROF, I knew it was, but TROF.D, like the TROF demon? What is this exactly? Where am I? Um, it's, this is obviously very old. Oh, there's, oh, there's a good old, there's HP 2621. That, that solves that problem. All right, so, <laughs> all right, clearly like TROF is on the scene. Maybe like, let's go to the TROF man page. Maybe TROF will tell us something about this thing. And oh my God, it actually mentions TA. Um, and I actually had to go up to the man pages to find this. But th this is the only mention of TA in the man pages. And it's, it's funny because it's so idiosyncratic. Um, that note, a rough ASCII version can also be printed out on ordinary terminals with an old and rarely used command, <laughs> user bin TA. This is the TROF man page calling something else old. <laughs> it's like, dude, dude, you were written, uh, you were, I mean, you were written before many people in the room were born. Like, how old can it be? Um, it's like, what the hell is this thing anyway? So it's I, old and rarely used, I guess. How do you know it's rarely used? Well, like, trust me, it's rarely used. All right, all right, I don't know how you know that. Um, but all right, let's, so where are we here? So we are in actually a very weird directory, this troff, troff.d. Let's actually go over there. Uh, and what, I mean, what the hell else is, I mean, I, this is a file, I, directory I'd never been in before. So let's go to troff.d. Um, and again, you can work in the source space for a long time and still not know it. And you look at this and, holy God, there's a read me. Oh my God. <laughs> there, I, Okay, all right, well let's obviously look at the readme. The readme will guide us. What does TA do? Oh, we got some new comments in the readme. The new comments from September 16th, 1983. How many of you were born after September 16th, 1983? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't think these comments are new. Um, I think this is some very, very old comments. But, the, but, but I am relieved to report that some minor bug fixes have been made. I don't know, I think you think we say fixed. Anyway, the, um, look at this, it's like, oh, we added Dan Barry's fixes to handle horizontal resolution properly. Like, what is this? And so you see up here, does this actually talk about TA at all? And, and you can see that actually it does. In particular, it contains a, pr a presentation of the output language, and then we get this kind of like TA, print ASCII on ordinary terminals. Crudely. Um, <laughs> now again, this is crudely when 1983 is new, so God only knows what this thing, but it's like, okay, so this thing clearly can take TROF and do something with it, no problem, we're just gonna go do that. So uh, let's go over to CD user share, CD man. We got a lot of TROF over here, let's go to man one, and let's just give it some go. Uh, let's, you know, SSH add dot one, fine, do it. Um, okay, come on TA, help me out buddy. Uh, Okay, uh, okay, nice, nice, of course, you don't take, it, thank you, you don't actually look at your, all right, it's, it refuses to actually look at all the files, uh, file install that one, do TA, file done, uh, you rule TA, okay, um, meanwhile, back over, back over to this readme, maybe this readme will guide me, and the burning question that I have is, so um, this version is the current evolution of the 8th edition TROF, um, we, are, we are in the lizard brain of Unix right here, <laughs> Um, it, it does not get any older than this. Um, and in particular, you know, you look at what this says, so print ASCII on ordinary out terminals crudely. That's kind of a weird phrasing. Come on, Google, help me out, man. Let's, let's get Google off the bench here, and let's go Google that, not that. 
Oh, that would be interesting. Um, boy, it's like I, I gotta watch what's in my type basically. All right, so let's go Google that, and actually let's go Google that as an exact phrase, and let's see if we can actually get a full version of this. And y you look at this, and oh, here we have an index of slash Martin, slash tape, <laughs> slash stuff, <laughs> slash, slash dit Roth, slash old T Roth. Again, this was old when it was put on this tape. It's like, oh my fucking God. And you look down here, and it's like, and it's the actual README, but it's the complete README. Um, and who actually did this? What, what strange place am I in? Suggestions would be welcome. One, Brian W. Kernigan. Um, now, um, I would love to get the full story from Brian. I mean, this is, I've, I've only been, been uh, doing this exploration this afternoon. Um, but needless to say, we are actually in the, we are in the, the mitochondrial DNA of Unix. And that's actually a better analog because it just kind of comes along with the ride forever. Um, and there's a huge story around T-Roth. Brian went in and tried to write T-Roth. The guy who actually wrote it, Joseph Fasana, had died. Um, and I think what this speaks to more than anything is the, if I may make, with the one serious point, I think this speaks to the persistence of what we're doing. Um, here we've got software that is obviously not operating entirely correctly, um, but software that was written before many of the people in the room were born. Um, and it has continued to stay with us. Um, it doesn't actually cost us anything other than the kind of oddness over here. Um, but it continues to stay with us. And once it works, T TA, bad example, BFS, probably better example, although it's within its original design parameters, it stays with us forever. Um, and that is a, th th that's a, a terrific power that what we have. We are engineering software, and software ha can have a timeless correctness that nothing else, or a timelessness, if not correctness, let's, let's leave it at that maybe, <laughs> um, a, 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 a timelessness that nothing else that we engineer can have. And, and I predict that in 10,000 years, someone will be doing a lightning talk, and they will discover this exact readme on their laptop. Thank you very much. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks especially to AppNeta, our sponsor, for this. There is a party. Um, starts now or started 20 minutes ago. Um, but there was really no way I was going to stop Brian. Um, nope. And so that'll be in the Mirror and Edinburgh rooms. And that's sponsored by AppNexus and Don. So thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.